government announces 14 billion Kina budget. Pirates inflicting terror in Medang court. And Craven Lay as the body of a seven year old boy recovered. This is National MTV News with Tokana Hasavi. A very good evening to you and welcome to Tuesday's News. Well, revenue received by the national government will be reduced in the coming year. Treasury Minister Patrick Pruach, when presenting the 2016 national budget today, said despite this projected fall in revenue, the government remains optimistic of successfully achieving its priorities in 2016. MTV's Maribatulo reports. Treasurer Patrick Pruaich addressed the national budget lockup just after midday today to provide an overview on what to expect in 2016. And whilst his announcement of reduced revenue did not surprise those present, the treasurer remained optimistic, saying the onus was now on the implementing agencies to be stringent in their spending to ensure the government's plans were realized. The situation has been, has been, has made, has been made even more dismal by the onset of the El Nino-induced drought which is causing havoc to farmers and, mem and people in vast parts of the country. In 2016, total revenue is projected at 12.179 billion kina, 292 million kina lower than the revised estimate for this year. Given this projection, the national government has introduced some measures to try to maximize money received from taxation, one such measure being the removal of discretionary exemptions of GST by the head of state acting on advice from the National Executive Council. This measure was suggested by the Tax Review Committee, which recently completed its report into the country's taxation regime. Dauveri Henau, Executive Director of the Business Council of PNG, in his assessment on the removal of GST exemptions, agreed with the government decision. For us, uh, the, the taxation system does help, but fundamentally, if you're able to have a, uh, a regulatory process that does provide the necessary um, st stable and predictable rules, it, it will attract investment. Meribatulo, National MTV News. The government presented a supplementary budget of 14.8 billion kina and a 14.2 billion kina 2016 budget today. The biggest cut in the supplementary budget is from the administrative sector, which took a cut of 756 million kina. MTV Sarah Apong reports. Other sector cuts in order of size in the supplementary budget are economic and infrastructure, law and justice sector, social sector, and provincial expenditure. The 2016 budget at 4.2 billion kina is 600 million kina less than the supplementary budget. The government is planning on financing this 14 billion kina budget with an expected revenue of 12.1 billion kina. A large part of that revenue is expected to come from taxes. In terms of expenditure, the largest share of the budget will be channeled through to provinces under the services improvement programs. While the administrative sector took a large cut in the supplementary budget at 2.5 billion kina, it makes up the second largest expenditure in the 2016 budget. The administrative budget includes 10 million kina for general elections and 80 million kina for the APEC authority, of which 35 million kina will go towards security preparations for both general elections and the APEC summit. Also included in the administrative budget for 2016 is 50 million kina for drought and disaster. The government is still keen to pursue its free social policies in health and education with budgets of 1.5 billion kina for health and 1.3 billion kina for the education sector. Other key priority sectors of transport and law and order both budgeted for 1.2 billion kina each. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. The body of a murdered seven-year-old boy recovered, also pirates in Madang court, and Governor Nauru back striking port workers. We'll bring you those stories and more after this break. Stay with us.
Welcome back to National MTV News. Well, grief in late tonight after police recovered the body of a seven-year-old boy who was killed and hidden in a bushland on the outskirts of the East Taraka suburb. Police tracked down the location after his suspect in his 20s admitted to the killing and told police where he hid the boy's body. The boy was reported missing yesterday. MTV Scott Whitey reports from Lang. Police were led to the edge of the East Taraka suburb on the banks of the Bumbu River and in thick bushland. The naked body of the seven-year-old was found. He had been suffocated with his underwear and shirt and stabbed in the belly. <laughs> Relatives who had searched yesterday and today arrived at the scene with police to identify him. The boy had gone to the Bumbu River yesterday with friends. An eyewitness said he was lured away by the suspect at around midday yesterday. It's understood the suspect who is known to the boy and his family told him his mother wanted him to go home. When he didn't return, his father and other family members went searching for him. This afternoon, the boy's body was recovered. Police went to the boy's father and relatives and explained that a post-mortem had to be conducted before he was handed back to them. It's understood the suspect had been drinking for the last four days. He was found and handed over to police. And after hours of questioning, he told police where he had hidden the body. There's a lot of frustration in the community right now, and especially amongst law enforcement officers. They feel there should be tougher penalties on those who produce illegal alcohol and those who consume it. Scott Wyde, National MTV News, Lee. Well, Medang police have caught two pirates suspected of holding up and stealing from people traveling on boats to and from the islands. The suspects were caught immediately after they held up a boat carrying 10 people, which included a mother and her infant. MTV's Rachel Shise reports from Medang. The passengers were ordered to get off the boat in the middle of the sea at gunpoint. Five adult men and a teenage swam for more than two hours before they were helped to shore by another boat, while six others, including an infant, were taken with the boat. One blab. Swift reactions by the police had them catching up on time to recover passengers who got dropped off on land, but most of the suspects got away while firing shots back at the police. The Medang police want to thank the couple who, after citing suspicious movements on the boat with the two suspects, alerted them. They are now appealing to the public to do the same. Meanwhile, other islanders confirmed that there's been a series of robberies at sea recently. The recent major robberies have also seen robbers escaping by boats, and the public is now calling for police presence at sea as much as on the land. However, the Medang police are going through a struggle, exhausting their current manpower, which is at the ratio of 1 is to 3,000 against the Medang population. Rachel Shiste, National MTV News, Medang. The Morambe governor has thrown his support behind striking lay port workers, saying the national government should back landowner companies instead of engaging foreign companies. Governor Kelly Naru met with port workers yesterday, hours after the stop work was declared. The national government, meanwhile, has described the strike as illegal. Well, Bank South Pacific, or BSP, has acquired Westpac Banking Corporation in the Solomon Islands. The acquisition process started in January this year and was completed last Friday after both Westpac and BSP obtained all necessary approvals in the Solomon Islands. BSP Group CEO Robin Fleming said the purchase as part of BSP's Pacific-based expansion strategy. 
The acquisition has placed Bank South Pacific as a leading Pacific regional financial services business. It is maximizing future opportunities for PNG's growing long-term trade and economic influence in the region. BSP has been expanding in the region since 2006 when it acquired the Habib Bank in Fiji, National Bank of Solomon Islands in 2007, and the colonial groups of companies, banking and life businesses in Fiji in 2009. In July 2015, BSP acquired Westpac operations in Cook Islands, Samoa and Tonga. The acquisition process started in January this year, and last Friday, BSP completed its purchase of the Westpac Banking Corporation in the Solomon Islands. BSP thanked the Central Bank of Solomon Islands for its approval of the acquisition. BSP has developed a strategic interest to find opportunities, build commercial relationships, and grow its presence in the economies of the South Pacific region. Chairman of BSP, Sir Costas Constantino, said the milestone transaction was also a positive example of the people of the South Pacific Island nations developing their capabilities in regional commercial and economic activities. Deli Waigeno, National MTV News. Well, following the budget lockup, Treasurer Patrick Proach presented the 2016 national budget to Parliament. But there was an uproar on the floor when opposition leader Don Polier's motion to move the budget debate to a later date caused a division. The majority of the members of parliament voted against an adjournment of the budget debate. Treasurer Patrick Pruach presented the 2015 supplementary budget and the 2016 national budget to parliament this afternoon. After presenting all the numbers, the Treasurer said the government adopted a conservative stance on both budgets in order to build a strong economy. Mr. Acting Speaker, in conclusion, by adopting a conservative stance on the 2015 and 2016 national budgets, the government has continued to build on the foundation of a strong and vibrant economy that will provide, provide improved opportunities and higher living standards for our people. Opposition leader Don Polia then moved a motion to have the budget debate postponed to a later date. There were more no's than eyes for the deferral, causing Mr. Polia to raise a point of order. Mr. Speaker, the point of order, I'm governor, make him cranky. Now I must receive him this little point of this little vote long all. Now I must give him seven days long. This little parliament want them all people long Papua New Guinea. Let's kill him. The last in bad set, now we debate good long next week, Tuesday, where we tradition long democracy, Mr. Speaker. Acting Speaker Ada Ganassi then called for a vote to gauge the numbers of MPs for and against an adjournment of the budget debate. Honorable members, those against the adjournment, please stand. the votes were tallied, it was 48-12 against an adjournment. Therefore, Parliament is still in session with the budget debate continuing. The budget is expected to be passed at the end of the debate later tonight. Deli Waigeno, National MTV News. And now let's check out the finance news. The Kina closed unchanged at 0.3405 US dollars in the interbank market today. And at Bank South Pacific, our Kino is trading at 0.3330 US dollars, 0.4627 Australian dollars, 0.2989 Euro, and 39.88 Japanese yen. Taking a look at commodity prices at New York close, copper closed the day lower, while gold, coffee, and cocoa closed the day higher. Palm oil and crude oil closed higher as well, while copper closed the day lower. And finally, on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 165 points higher, the ASX closed at 6 points lower, and the All Ordinaries closed at 8 points higher. Well, National MTV News continues after these short messages. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the news. It's a requirement that all Papua New Guineans must have a national identification card. The rollout of the NID system is compulsory and people who refuse to be registered will have difficulty accessing banking and government services. National Planning Minister Charles Abel says the ID system will strengthen government structure and improve planning. The government's national identification system is compulsory for all citizens. Having an ID card is critically important. In a few months from now, the national identification card will be an essential requirement for all public servants. Those employed in government departments will have to be registered as a requirement to be on the government's payroll. National Planning Minister Charles Abel said this system will get rid of ghost names on the payroll and improve government systems. As we move forward, and there will be an announcement coming with the budget, uh, public servants will be required to have NID card in order to remain on the government payroll. So uh, we have this uh, commencing with NCDC. The NID card will become compulsory when you want to open a new account with a financial institution. Banks, especially BSP, said the NID card will in future become a requirement for any PNG national accessing banking and doing transactions. Registered General Dixon Kiragi said they aim to register all citizens by 2018. Every one of us need an ID. Obviously, one will still come forward and get an ID. Now, the challenge for us is that can we deliver it to you on time? We are getting there. The National Identification Project was initiated by the national government and was rolled out last year. So far, only 1% of the country's population have registered. Quintana Lomp, National MTV News. Papua New Guinea's acting chief ombudsman, Phoebe Sangatari, has urged young women to become agents of change and contribute meaningfully to the country's development. Ms Sangatari says women need more empowerment programs to strengthen their leadership, starting in the family units and then the community. Ms Sangatari is a shining example of women working in a once male-dominated work environment. Speaking at the Caritas Technical Secondary School's 16th grade 12 graduation today, her challenge to graduates was to achieve their life goals. More women to venture into this area, sir, so that we can help, we can um, uh, participate and uh, contribute to the development of Papua New Guinea, join our men folk and um, contribute to the development of Papua New Guinea, not just wait for the men to do everything. Uh, we've got to step up. Sangitari highlighted the PNG constitution gives women the mandate to participate in all development aspects like politics, applying the skills, knowledge and values for a positive change. I try to convey to the young girls here as they leave this school and venture into whatever that um, they have in life. Caritas Directress Sister Florentina Cho said more teachers are needed in the technical field and called on the national government to provide more training to nationals. Meanwhile, in the award category, the 2015 Ducks was awarded to Nina Sinu and Diane Nalai. If there is one thing I learned while studying in this institution, apart from the academic and technical knowledge and skills, it would be the virtues. And the values in these virtues that we listen to every Monday morning assembly and try to practice throughout the week at school and at home. Having to understand and practice these virtues has made me more responsible for my education and to care. Marilyn Diaukatam, National MTV News. The Cancer Foundation today announced the start of the 2015 Movember campaign in Port Moresby. It was launched by Imelda Argon, CEO of the National Gaming Board Control and Cancer Foundation PNG CEO, Daddy Toka Jr. Movember campaign is a new addition to the foundation's annual campaign and is part of the Men's Cancer Awareness Month. Statistically, Port Moresby lacks information concerning cancers affecting the male population of PNG. The Movember campaign aims to encourage the men of PNG to converse about cancer in order to bring the statistics into the open. 
Daddy Toka stressed that in order for the foundation to address the issue, this was an essential first step. Uh, we want to encourage men of uh, Papua New Guinea to start the conversation about cancer and educate them on how they can protect themselves and their families from the disease. The Movember campaign aims to uh, change the way of thinking by putting a fun twist uh, on a very, very serious issue. Using the mustache as a catalyst, uh, the, idea is, the idea is to bring about change and give men the opportunity and confidence to uh, learn and talk about men's cancer, uh, promoting action when needed. In support of the Men's Cancer Awareness in PNG, Imelda Argon on behalf of the National Gaming Control Board in PNG presented a check of 32,000 kina. Cancer Foundation's PNG's initiative in launching the 2015 Movember campaign now breaks the silence on men's cancer and at the same time paves way for more awareness. Right now I urge all other corporate entities to come also come on board and support Cancer Foundation PNG. The foundation will use the funds to run a men's cancer awareness workshop on the 9th of November at the Grand Papua Hotel here in Port Moresby. The workshop will be hosted by Professor Ian Alva, a cancer researcher, bioethicist and medical oncologist with senior posts in Australia and abroad. His expertise is widely sought across the sector and by the national government. The workshop has 50 placements available to the general public on a first-come, first-served basis. Both men and women alike are encouraged to participate. Melissa Govira, National MTV News. To regional news now in Vanuatu, young children are the most prone to the extreme dryness from the El Nino that has also impacted other Melanesian countries. The impact in Vanuatu is made worse by the destruction caused by Category 5 Cyclone Pam in March this year, with many villages still recovering. The ABC reported the death of an infant with unconfirmed reports of two other deaths in the north of Tana Island where the effects of the droughts are most felt. The El Nino impact comes off the back of Cyclone Pam that devastated Vanuatu in March, causing damage estimated at almost two-thirds of the country's GDP. More cyclone activity is expected across the southwest Pacific between November and April due to the strong El Nino effect which may worsen the current drought conditions. Villages on Tana, one of the islands worst hit by Cyclone Pam, are bearing much of the brunt. People are struggling to grow crops, water sources are drying up and people are surviving on government handouts of rice noodles and tinned fish. Hospital wards are full of malnourished babies and their distraught mothers. Back in Papua New Guinea, the Prime Minister's department says the government has spent almost 13 million kina on relief supplies and deliveries to the worst affected areas. The PNG government estimates providing ongoing food relief will cost about 175 million kina for the next 6 to 12 months. Now we all have experienced this one way or another. Your phone slips from your hand, drops to the ground, you pick it up and then go through that painstaking moment to check if your phone is cracked or broken. But tech giant Motorola believes cracked screens could soon be a thing of the past. In a partnership with Verizon, Motorola introduced the Droid Turbo 2 last week, which claims to be the first phone with a shatterproof screen. Its five-layer shatterproof shield technology is designed to be shock absorbent. The back of the screen is an aluminium chassis that the rest of the display is fastened to, which makes the screen durable. The Droid, the Droid Turbo 2 is selling in the U.S. for $624, just over 1,800 kina. Well, True Guy Sports is coming up next, the Melbourne Cup and Papua New Guinea's female rugby star making it big in Europe. I'll be back with the details. Stay with us. Two Kai Sports.
Thanks for joining me with True Guy Sports to the race course. And history was made in the race that Stops a Nation and Prince of Penzance beat immense odds to claim victory in the 2015 Melbourne Cup. Jockey Michelle Payne became the first female jockey to win the richest and most pre prestigious race, the 6.2 million Australian million dollar Melbourne Cup. Pre-race favourite Criterion lagged behind as Payne bidded her time until well into the final straight before pushing the 100 to 1 shot clear of the pack 200 metres from the line and held off a charging Max Dynamite by three quarters of a length. Criterion crossed the, the line third in the gruelling 302 3,200 metre handicap at the Flemington recourse, race course. A number of Papua New Guineans abroad have claimed, has claimed a first in their field of work and likewise in sports. Well, Kenya made it to the top, donning the Wallabies jumper, but now there is a woman making it big in the world of rugby as well. She slipped under the radar and shunned away from the publicity until now. Melanie Kawa was born in Mendy in Southern Ireland and spent much of her adulthood abroad. The 28-year-old has been a superstar for women's rugby in Australia and has gone on to being the first woman to play professional rugby in Europe's elite professional competition. This is the story of Melanie Kawa's journey up the ranks. Mel Kawa or Meli Mel, whatever suits you, familiarise yourselves with this name. She has had the opportunity to represent Papua New Guinea and play for the Palais, but chose otherwise. Instead, she's doing it big overseas. In fact, bigger than anyone ever has. Her rugby career began in 2006 when she debuted for Brisbane's premier rugby club, UQ Rugby, and has since been a part of the club's success. She's represented Queensland in the 2013 National Championships and again has been a regular name in the selection for rep rugby in Queensland and Australia. But an opportunity to move to join elite French club in the European professional club rugby competition, Montpellier, has seen the 28-year-old become the first Papua New Guinean female to play rugby at that level. <laughs> Le premier essay marqué par Melanie Kawa not only carries the pride of PNG overseas, but is one example of women breaking barriers and has set the benchmark and guidelines for women's rugby here in Papua New Guinea. Lorraine Genia, National MTV Sports. True Kai Sports. Good to have you back with True Guy Sports. Over to football. The Solomon Islands under-17 women's team has withdrawn from the 2016 Oceania Football Championship under-17 women's championship in the Cook Islands. This withdrawal will see the match schedule rearranged to cater for other teams in Group A, of which Solomon Islands was originally scheduled for. MTV's Shane Sawaya reports. Match is scheduled for 90 minutes. The withdrawal now sees a slight change in Group A, which was set to include Solomon Islands. However, the four remaining teams, New Caledonia, Tonga, Samoa and defending champions, New Zealand, will commence. According to Oceania Football website, the match day schedule for Group A was redrawn at the OFC headquarters in Auckland, New Zealand. The change now means the competition will start four days later and run from 13 to the 23rd of January next year. Meanwhile, Group B is unaffected and will be contested by Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, Fiji and Cook Islands. The structure for the knockout stages of the competition remains unchanged, with the top two teams from each group progressing to the semi-finals. The winner of the 2016 OFC Under-17 Women's Championship qualifies for the FIFA Under-17 Women's World Cup in Jordan later next year. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. Well, Port Moresby will once again be the centre of attraction in, in the Pacific with the recent announcement by the Oceania Football Confederation that the city will host the 2016 OFC Nations Cup. These remarks were made by PNG Football Association Operations Manager Idris Kumbrawa during the final of the Best of Cup in Ley. MTV's Jeremy Moggy reports. 
participating countries in the OFC Nations Cup will include New Caledonia, the Solomon Islands, Fiji, four-time champions New Zealand and of course host Papua New Guinea and in the under 20 Women's World Cup Asian heavyweights Japan have already secured a spot in that event on top of that the PNG women's senior national team will be taking on New Zealand for a single qualifying spot in the Rio Olympics for 2016 it's an excellent opportunity for us to showcase what we have in the country and I think football football is growing and the standard we saw during the PNG games uh, uh, at the South Pacific Games clearly shows that uh, the standard has risen and it will improve. It will continue to improve. That announcement comes as an added bonus, especially after the men's team's bronze medal after 28 years. And the women's senior team garnering a fourth consecutive gold medal. Both results in the Pacific Games. Kumbrawa has been brought on as operations manager, overseeing the enormous task of organizing a high-level competition. I, I don't think I have a whole lot. I think when you talk to the, uh, our CEO, he, might, he, he will be in position because that's uh, more of the uh, technical area for the executive committee to know. The OFC announcement is unique in the fact that Papua New Guinea will now not only host a regional qualifying tournament for the Pacific, but also stay claim to being one of the first nations outside of New Zealand to host a FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup. France and Sweden are some of the big countries that have already qualified for the Women's Under-20 World Cup, while Papua New Guinea is still in the process of finalizing a squad for that event. In any case, 2016 holds big promise for a country that has long been starved of any international sporting events. Jeremy Moggy, National TV Sports. Well, that wraps up our True Kai Sports segment for tonight. Stay tuned. We have the weather details that's coming up next. True Kai Sports. True Kai Sports. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. In southern region, Port Moresby to look forward to possible evening showers and thunderstorms. Brief showers expected in Daru. Karama and Alata to look forward to evening showers and possible thunderstorms, while Popondata to expect few showers. In the Momase region, brief showers expected in Lei, Medang and Wewak, while Thunimore to look forward to few showers. In the New Guinea Islands, evening showers plus thunderstorms expected in Kimbet, mostly fine in Loringal, few showers in Buka, while Kokopo, Kavang and Rabaul, brief showers. And in the islands region, Mount Hagen, Mendi and Wabe to look forward to evening showers, then morning fog, while brief evening showers, then morning fog expected in Garoka and Kumbiawa. And now let's take a look at forecasts for small ships, but first there is a strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait, Daru to Kiwai Island to Karama, to Yule Island, Hood Point and all Milan Bay Islands. There is a warning of strong southeast winds of 25 to 34 knots and they are expected to persist for the next 24 hours causing rough seas. A note to all small crafts and boats, they are advised to take necessary precautions before going out to seas. Now let's take a look at waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait, Daru to Kiwai Island, to Karama, Hul Island, through to Hood Point, to Samurai Island, seas of 2 metres to 3 metres, waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel to Finchafen, with waters west of Long Island to Medang to Bogia. We work to Aitape, Fanimore and the northern PNG Indonesian border with waters of New Island to New Britain and Bougainville, seas of 0.5 to 1.5 metres, waters of eastern and western Milan Bay Islands, seas of 2 to 2.5 metres, waters of Finchafen including Vitia Strait, Siasi Islands to Tami Island and Long Island, seas of 1 metre to 2 metres, and lastly, waters of Manus and its western group of islands, seas of 0.5 to 
to 1.3 meters. And now looking at ocean forecasts for PNG areas, Coral Sea sees rough with east to southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots. Solomon Sea sees rather rough with southeast winds at 20 to 25 knots. Bismarck Sea sees slight to moderate with northeast to southeast winds at 10 to 20 knots. Pacific Ocean lastly sees slight with northeast winds at 10 to 15 knots. And now let's recap our top stories for tonight. Before we go, government announces 14 billion kina budget. Also, pirates inflicting terror in Medan court and grief in Lay as the body of a seven-year-old boy recovered. Well, that wraps up the bulletin for tonight. On behalf of the news crew, I'm Tokana Asavi Jr. Thanks for your company. You take care and stay happy. Good night.